we are going to kick it now. Hello, everybody. Good evening. Happy Thursday. We are live streaming for a brand new technician class uh, for those wanting to get your amateur radio license. Uh, thanks for joining tonight. My name is Jason. I'm KC5HWB. Uh, on with me tonight is Chris Cotter, KD5HIY from the Hearst Amateur Radio Club. I'm going to introduce him here in just a minute. Uh, really uh, enjoy that we were able to do this tonight and um, looking forward to seeing how it goes. I'm a little bit nervous. I don't know why. I've live streamed a lot in the past, but I've never done a presentation like this before. And honestly, I'm not doing anything tonight. I'm just click and go. I'm going to introduce Chris here in a minute and he's going to take over and, and present. And he's done this a bunch of times. I know you guys will like it. The, the, the information being presented here has been um, used in several training classes at the Hearst Amateur Radio Club in Mid-Cities, Texas. You can find their website at w5hrc.org and um, uh, find more information about them. If you're in the North Texas area, I highly recommend that you check them out sometime. Uh, they have a monthly uh, meeting on month. I think it's the third Monday of every month, uh, but they meet every Saturday. Um, when things aren't on lockdown, <laughs> they meet every Saturday. Uh, they do uh, a lot of times they'll go to breakfast on Saturday and other times they will um, meet at their uh, at their emergency operations center to just talk about ham radio. So uh, really uh, big special thanks to those guys for allowing me to live stream this. Uh, once again, let, let me uh, go over a couple of questions that were asked to me because I've been advertising this for about three weeks. Um, this is a training course. We will not be doing testing at the end of at the end of the course. Um, throughout the night tonight, you will be able to type in the, uh, in this, and what's called the super chat, which is the live chat right next to the YouTube video. If you're on, uh, if you're on a computer browser, it's easier to see than if you're on a phone, but you can do it on a phone too, phone or tablet. Um, we'll put some links in there. Frank is in the chat. He is one of my admins. Uh, Frank, if you want to go ahead and put, uh, links in there from the Google document that I put in there earlier, I shared two links about online testing. There's a couple of different places that are doing online and remote testing. So after you've gone through this curriculum and you feel, and Chris is gonna give you several practice tests, um, several places online to take a practice test for free. There's several websites out there where you can do that and we'll put those links in the chat later on as well. Um, but once you feel comfortable, you can go to one of these places uh, for the online testing. Um, if Frank is awake, we may have to wake, wake Frank up. I don't know. But, uh, but anyway, that's, um, <laughs> that is, uh, the, the, the three night tonight, tomorrow night and Saturday will be a training course. And after that, hopefully you'll be ready to, uh, to take your test, um, after doing some free online practicing. So several people have asked me about a general class. Okay. So there's currently three levels of, te of amateur radio license, and this is part of the information you'll learn tonight as well. Technician is the first. If you never had a license, you get a technician license. Once you upgrade, it's called a general, and the top one, the tier three, is called an extra. A lot of people have asked about a general class. Will I be doing a general class after this? I actually recorded the general class last fall that this same club put on, and it's on my channel. I will share that link in the chat later on, too. There's Frank sharing some... Uh, yeah, there's Frank sharing. the. Those are online testing places that he, he, just, uh, he just shared in the chat. Yes, Mike. Someone printed my call sign wrong. Thank you for noticing. So, um, but there's a general class on my channel. It's in a playlist. There's six episodes. You will be able to, you can go back and watch those anytime you want to. They are up, posted, and um, ready to go, and anybody can watch those. Um, so once you get past the technician, that's already there for you. I might try to talk to the club about doing a live stream general so we can take some questions, but you don't have to wait because that's already there. Um, we're going to try to filter through as many of the questions tonight. If you have a question, put, post it in the super chat. When Chris is presenting, he's going to be focused on presenting. Frank and I and a couple other people are going to be watching the chat on YouTube, and we're going to try to copy all the questions down. If we get overwhelmed or if you have to drop off or something, send an email to questions at livefromthehamshack.tv, and we will. I, I'll get those tonight or tomorrow, and we might read them tomorrow night, or I might just reply to you with the answer if if I know the answer, I may have to look it up, but, um, uh, yeah. Uh, so if, so questions in the chat, questions via email are both welcomed. 
Um, there is a super chat on YouTube. YouTube allows a super chat and it allows donations. Now, let me explain what a super chat is real quick. There's a dollar sign right underneath where you chat. And it, if you mouse over the dollar sign, it says show your support for Ham Radio 2.0. You can contribute. You can donate a dollar, two dollars, something like that, whatever amount you want. If you do the super chat for a monetary value, it puts your question at the top of the list. That's just the way YouTube works. You do not have to pay to ask questions. That's not what I'm saying. Anybody can ask questions. We're going to try to get to them. But a lot of people have, have contacted me, said, how do I pay for the class? How do I send you money? That's how you do it right there because that question was asked. Um, I'm also going to be, last thing, before we get started here, I'm going to bring Chris on. I'm also going to be posting, starting Monday, um, several videos that I'm entitling a new ham workshop, what to do right after you get your license, suggestions for which radio to buy, that kind of thing. So subscribe to this channel on YouTube if you haven't already. And um, the videos that I start posting next week are going to be for someone who just got their license. So let me go ahead and bring Chris over right there. Chris, if you'll uh, unshare your screen real quick just so we can see who you are. There you go. Okay, audio test. You're muted. One, two, there three. There you go. <laughs> awesome. Okay, cool, man. Well, thank you for uh, thank you for being willing to to sit down and do this tonight. Um, maybe it'll be a little bit more. Um, uh, maybe it'll be a little bit quicker because you don't have people asking you questions in real time. But uh, but during the breaks of the session, like we like we discussed earlier, I will be trying to to uh, administer some of those questions. So um, the floor is yours, sir. Okay. Let me bring this back up. Well, thank you everybody for uh, for coming in. Um, as Jason said, this is provided by the Hearst Amateur Radio Club, Hearst Racies. Uh, my name is Chris Cotter. KD5HIY is my call sign. Been a ham for about uh, 21 years. Um, done this class about eight times. So uh, really looking forward to it. Um, also going to have Frank, KG5HJ, Noel, KF5SOK, Jason, uh, KC5HWB, along with Ham Radio 2, um, bringing this to you. Um, I do want to give a very special thanks to Mike Hafner, N5YM. He actually put all of these slides together, uh, so this would not be, of a, we would not be able to do this without him. So this is session one. Uh, it will be three sessions total. And um, this is going to be preparation for the amateur radio technician class license examination. You should have your book, um, and it will be the 2018 2022 question pool um, from, from uh, Gordon West. The goal is to help you pass the technician exam. We don't just want to. We, just, we don't want you just to pass the technician exam. We want you to understand why uh, things are the way they are. Uh, we're also going to introduce you to some of the basic principles of emergency communications, or MCOM is what we call it. Um, during this class, you'll see a star. You'll see a star pop up. That's going to let you know that that is an answer to the question, to a question in the question pool, uh, as well as yellow text will also be something to look out for this is not a supplement for the book you will need to study your license manual uh, you will need to memorize some things such as frequencies formula rules and regulations um, most everything else you'll learn how things work so you can figure out the correct answer uh, if you take what you learn here combined with what your book what you read in the book you're gonna you'll do well on the test we've had a pretty good success rate uh, some of the, the things that we've come across for effective study habits, you know, just start at the beginning, reach each assigned section. Um, the book is broken down into multiple chapters. Each chapter does uh, include specific things. Um, so just read each question, read all the answers, uh, read the explanation for the correct answer, um, and then highlight the correct answer. That way it stands out. Um, if there's something that you don't understand, you can start over at the beginning and uh, then you just study the correct answers that you've highlighted. This is the technician class, so we, uh, we're going to lean on the basic concepts about the, uh, the main aspects of amateur radio. 
going to be kind of like this Whitman sampler here. You're going to get a little bit of everything. You're not going to get in-depth discussion regarding uh, a specific area. It's going to be um, a lot, a little bit, or a lot, a little bit, a, a, a lot of information about a lot of stuff. So um, we're going to try and keep it to what we have in the book. That way, uh, uh, because the higher you go up in testing, uh, sometimes you might run into which question is the most correct or something like that. So we're going to keep it focused to really what we read in in the manual. This is going to prepare you for the Element 2 Amateur Radio Technician Examination. Um, it does assume a basic understanding of rules and regulations. Uh, that's what the, the test does. Electronic theory and radio communication principles and practices. Uh, so like I said, we're going to keep our discussions limited to the basic level consistent with the question pool. Uh, the questions and answers that are in your book are the questions and answers that you will find on the test. There's not going to be super, you know, secret. It's not like a, a, an IT certification where you never see some of the questions until that day. You actually have it in your hand. Uh, we're going to discuss more advanced discussion of more advanced aspects. We can do that. Uh, afterwards or in uh, the super chat or anything like that so we'll get started so who is an amateur radio operator uh, an amateur radio operator is a person named in an amateur operator named an amateur operator primary license grant in the fcc uls database the uls database is the master fcc database that holds license information for all radio services, whether that's commercial, television, it's, it, everything is there. When you see your name in there, then you assigned a, with a call sign, you will be an amateur operator. Um, a station in an amateur radio service consisting with the apparatus necessary for carrying on radio communications. That's what a radio station is. So that's going to be like uh, something like this, if you can see in the uh, in the picture I can't really can't but uh that can be a handheld radio that can be a mower radio it can be a um a base radio hf you know any number of things uh so that's going to be the apparatus that's the radio station itself so why do we exist we have a lot of really prime real estate when it comes to um the radio bands uh, some of it could be sold off for millions, or excuse me, billions of dollars, but uh, we, the FCC gives it to us. Um, and the reason they do is because um, it gives recognition and enhancement of the value of the amateur service to public as a voluntary non-commercial communication service. Um, MCOM, emergency communications, is one big aspect of that. Uh, continuation and extension of the amateur's proven ability to contribute to the advancement of the radio art. Um, that's basically a lot of things that a lot of radio technologies that you see today got their start in amateur radio because we, we have the ability to do a lot of experimentation and not have problems with the FCC. That's one of the things, experimentation. Uh, encouragement and improvement of the amateur service through rules, which provide for advancing in skills, uh, advancing skills in both the communication and technical phases of the art, um, as well as expansion in, of the existing reservoir within the amateur radio service of trained operators, technicians, and electronic experts. Uh, this is a technical hobby, so you will be uh, getting hands-on a little bit with electronics and, and working with things like that. And then the final thing here is continuation and extension of the amateur's unique ability to enhance international goodwill. We're not a polit we're not politicians. I'm not a politician, but I have I have talked with people all across the world on amateur radio and become friends with them. Um, so that's regardless of what your political viewpoint is. That does that's that's. Uh, uh, that is not important. It's uh, we we have the ability to represent um, ourselves uh, on the international stage using amateur radio. So the FCC, they are the the uh, rule making enforcing enforcement body. Um, the Federal Communications Commission, 
makes and enforces the rules for the amateur radio service in the U.S. and its possessions. Uh, amateur radio licensees are issued by the FCC. Um, examinations for amateur radio licenses are handled by um, two different teams. We have the volunteer examination coordinators. That is an organization that is uh, that is appointed by the FCC to issue uh, test and paperwork and everything needed. Uh, we, as volunteer examiners, who is the, the next part, we are a lazy liaison between the VE and the FCC. Um, that's going to be the coordinator. The volunteer examiners are going to be your local team who actually give you the test. So you, when you sit down to do a test, there will be uh, three of us. And we will do all the paperwork, and then you will take the test. We'll grade it on site, so you you will know right then if you've passed or failed. Then that paperwork gets sent off to the FCC for processing and license issuing. So currently, the FCC issues three license classes. Each license class allows operation in certain bands, um, which is basically a like a group of frequencies. Uh, using certain modes. The higher the class of license, the more allowable frequency bands available uh, that are used for use. So you, right now we are starting at the technician license. That is your foundation. We're, then we're going to, if you want to upgrade, you're going to go to general and then you will, you will also go to amateur extra. So the technician is, like I said, is the foundation license. This is where you get your, your, your base understanding for most of the, the principles of amateur radio. The general builds on the technician. If those of you who are going to eventually upgrade to general will notice that the, uh, the general class is about 20 to 25% uh, technician theory. A lot of the, a lot of overlap there. So when you upgrade to general, you get more privileges. You don't lose anything. And then the third step is the extra. Extra builds on the general. It is a uh, it's heavily uh, math oriented. It's it's kind of a, a difficult test, um, but then that gives you all the privileges in amateur radio. And as I said, you do not lose anything. So we've had some people say, "Well, I don't want to upgrade to technician or upgrade to general because I don't want to lose." my technician you don't do that you actually you just gain and it builds on top <clears throat> any just about anyone is eligible to get an amateur radio license young old male female u.s citizen uh resident alien um there are certain people that can that are ineligible if you're a representative of a foreign government if you're an ambassador or some sort of diplomat you are not eligible to get an SEC amateur radio license. Also, persons convicted of certain criminal activities, usually those center around some sort of um, radio-centric uh, crimes. Um, one thing that I want to make sure that we, uh, we stress is that physical disabilities are not a barrier to qualifying for an amateur radio license. Uh, we've given licenses to, or license exams to, uh, some that are deaf, some that are blind, we will make the accommodations to whatever whatever you need. Uh, this is both because we want you to get your license and also because there are laws that, that dictate that. So um, please don't let any kind of disability or anything like that stop you from getting your license if you would like. So these are gonna be our volunteer examiners. Um, they don't look really like that in real life, but um, a volunteer examiner is a uh, amateur accredited by one or more VECs, one or more of the uh, the coordinators who volunteers to administer amateur license exam. When you do your test, you need a minimum of three examiners uh, to be present at the exam. Uh, all must hold an amateur license of general or higher to conduct a technician examination. So the main thing here is anytime you're doing an amateur radio test, there will be three examiners there to watch you, to grade, and make sure that the paperwork is completely done. So this is essentially the process right here. 
starting down here in the very bottom. Uh, this is you taking your test and doing all the paperwork. Uh, your All of your paperwork will end up going to a volunteer examiner coordinator, the organization itself who accredits the VEs. Uh, that will, they will take your paperwork. They will enter it into the uh, FCC's computers, make sure everything is right, and then that is electronically sent over to the uh, FCC, and then they verify that everything is satisfying to them, and then they issue you a license, and you will get that electronically online. So you are preparing for the technician class examination, which is element two. There is an element one uh, that is no longer in existence. That was for a previous class that no longer exists, but they, they just kept element two. Uh, there will be 35 questions. The questions are word for word, same as in your question pool that you have in your book. Uh, so you will take that, combine it with your answer sheet, and we'll give you as much time as you need. Your passing grade is 74%. That means that uh, you have to get at least 26 out of 35 questions answered correctly. If you get that, you pass, and then you get issued a CSCE, Certificate of Successful Completion of Examination. That is your golden ticket saying that you have passed the test. A copy of that goes to uh, the FCC for evidence that you passed your test with them, and then they can issue a license after that. So you've passed your test, and I'm confident that uh, as long as you uh, you read the book, you will pass your test. You can begin operating when your call sign appears in the FCC ULS database. This is basically what it looks like. It still looks like this today. Um, you'll find your name and a call sign as well as an FRN, um, expiration date, telling you that it's active as long as you see your name in there with a call sign you are an amateur radio operator and this is what your uh, your license form will look like this is what uh, you will be able to print off they used to send these to you now they don't you have to go and you have to print it yourself so the top part of it you just cut it out frame it Put it at your uh, your permanent location as a uh, you know a, a showing what you've done. Um, the bottom part you detach and keep it or a copy on your person wherever oper you operate. I generally keep mine in my wallet. I've had it uh, laminated, and that way, if for some reason you're stopped by a police officer and they wonder what it is you have in your car or truck, you can say that's an amateur radio. Here's a Here's a copy of my license, and uh, that way you don't have to worry about any uh, any kind of anything that they may try to say. Uh, you are responsible for the proper operation of the station in accordance with the FCC rules. We're going to go over some of those rules uh, shortly. So the amateur radio license is issued by the FCC, as we said, serves two purchase purposes. It is your operator license. It's saying that you, as an individual, have done your done everything you need to do. You were properly licensed, as well as it also says that your primary station, whether that's at your house or in your car or wherever that is, your primary station, that is also a license to for you to use that. One person can hold one operator primary station license, um, and that's it. You cannot have two or three. Uh, amateur radio license. It is one and one only. So when you get ready to take your test, you're going to fill out a form 605. You want to make sure that your mailing address is current in the FCC ULS database. If mail is returned to the FCC as undeliverable, your license can and more than likely will be revoked or at least suspended. Uh, that can be a P.O. box if you would like. If you don't use a regular mailbox, you can use a P.O. box. That's perfectly fine as long as your mail is deliverable at that area. Uh, the FCC needs to be able to find you. Now, here is a touchy subject that some people do not like. By getting your amateur radio license, the FCC revert reserves the right to inspect your station at any time. 
Now that is not like a search warrant. We're going to talk about that a little bit more uh, in a little bit. That is to inspect your your equipment and only your equipment at any time. Um, and you have to have done something very bad. You'd be warned um, usually multiple times before they will show up to inspect your stuff. An amateur radio license uh, license term is 10 years. So if you were to get your license uh, on May 1st, 2020, in 10 years, on in uh, May 1st, was it 2030, your license would expire. Up until 90 days until your, your license expires, you can renew uh, in that, that area or in that time period. Um, and then if for some reason you don't renew, you have a two-year grace period. You cannot operate while you're in that grace period. Um, but the FCC holds on to all of your information, and all you have to do is go renew. That's easy to do online. Uh, you just log in with the username and password, uh, go in there, and then just let me literally click renew, and it, it renews you. If you go over that two years, then you basically have to start from scratch. So 10 years with a two-year grace period, you can renew 90 days before expiration. So once you have a license, you can operate uh, anywhere the FCC has jurisdiction. That's continental U.S., Alaska, Hawaii, Guam, Puerto Rico, and the Virgin Islands, as well as other countries with reciprocal operating agreements. You can find those agreements um, online. Uh, and then that way, if you're going somewhere in Europe, you can take your radio with you and you can operate in there according to their rules. Regardless what uh, language you speak, you can speak whatever language to anybody. You must identify in English. That is the stipulation. So speak whatever language you want, but identify in English. Once you have a license, you can also operate in international waters or international airspace when aboard a U.S. registered ship or aircraft. However, you must have permission from the ship captain or aircraft pilot in command. Um, I don't know if ships have the ability to detect whether you have transmissions coming off the boat, but it's best to get permission. Uh, I have actually run into uh, uh, stations on airplanes operating HF on a long flight operating HF, uh, Aeromobile. Um, and then there, regarding the ships, there is kind of a, uh, odd, odd, odd requirements because it says U S registered ship or aircraft. Well, most ships are not registered in the United States. They're registered in like Panama or someplace like that. Um, but there are amateur radio, um, so you can get on where you can get on the ship and you can do that. You just have to have permission. So looking at an amateur radio call sign, um, up first, it just, it looks like a, a bunch of random letters and numbers. Uh, each call sign is unique. None are, ex are, are exactly the like the format depends on the class of the license. Uh, your call sign identifies both you, the operator and your station. So in this one, this is what we call a two by three. This has got two letters, a number, followed by uh, three letters in your suffix. That's what you will be issued. You will be issued a two by three. That way, uh, uh, that's, that's just part of how the FCC issues out licenses. Now, the, uh, the prefix will either be one or two letters, always. The first letter in the prefix in the United States will always be A, K, N, or W. So in this case, it is a K, um, a K, E, 5, X, Y, Z, A, K, N, or W are the, pre uh, the uh, prefixes that will always begin a United States uh, amateur radio license. The district number will go from zero to nine, depending on your area. You'll see a map here shortly. Um, of the different areas i'm in i am currently in five which is a covers texas arkansas and a few other southern states one way you can remember uh the aknw as somebody in one of our classes said alaska is northwest 
thought that was pretty clever. So AKNW, Alaska is Northwest. So looking at this, I'm going to give you about five seconds to, uh, to look at this and make a determination before I give the answer. Which of the following is a valid U.S. amateur call sign? The answer is going to be W3ABC. That starts with AK enter W, uh, has one number between 0 and 9, and then three letters in the suffix. So W3ABC is the correct answer. The top one doesn't make any sense, doesn't follow the format. The second one doesn't have a number, and then the third one is all numbers with a letter. So it's uh, that one is not correct. This is how they ish, how the FCC issues licenses. They issue them in sequential order. So uh, at the time of this writing, KE5 AAA, then the next person will AAB, the next person will be A, C, D, E, F, and so on. Um, your first time license technician amateur initially receives a sequentially issued two by three format station call sign. Uh, you don't get to choose this call sign. This in one that is initially uh, issued to you, the FCC just gives it to you based on whatever they have. Where you live determines the district for issuing a call sign. So if you look at California and Hawaii, and I believe Alaska, there's sixes. Um, Washington down to Arizona and Montana, there's seven. Southern states are five, uh, four, nine, zero. All, all the numbers are in there just depending on which states you're in. Uh, a person may only hold one primary station amateur radio license. However, an amateur operator may be a trustee for more than one club license. Uh, club license must have at least four. A club must have at least four license, four members. Excuse me, before I can, before it can get a club license. So you you are a license E. You have your your amateur radio license. KD five H L Y is me. Um, if I want to be trustee for a club license, somebody has to be responsible. I can be the trustee there. I would be the one that the FCC wants to come to whenever they have information or they need to get information. I would be the trustee of that club license. Um, you can apply through a, through a club station, look through, apply through a club station call sign administrator. I'm sorry, a little tongue twisted there. We also have special events call stations, call signs. Uh, any FCC licensed amateur operator may apply for a temporary one-by-one -one special event station. Uh, it's the special event call signs are issued for a short duration, usually for the length of the event, and then they get recycled. Uh, I'll give you an example of this. The Hearst Amateur Radio Club just had its 50th anniversary a couple of years ago. So we applied for W5H. Uh, we got that. We used it for a little while. And then at the end of our celebration, it went back to be recycled and was issued out again. So that's a one by one. That's a special event offers, uh, a station. Anybody can get it, but it has to be for a special event. Now, you can add self-assigned indicators to your call sign for clarification or to provide an additional information. So in this, this example, KL7CC stroke W3, he's going to be operating in District 3. Uh, WN5YM stroke QRP means he is specifically going to be operating in low power. Uh, KM5TZ stroke XE, XE is the uh, operating license um for mexico so xe so km5tz stroke xe these are self-assigned these do not go through the the arl excuse me do not go through the uh, the fcc i have a uh kd5 hiy stroke qrp because i plan to start operating low power that's something that i set up myself and whenever i choose to operate under that mode i will operate under that that call sign as long as i have my my real call sign i can put stroke qrp out the end of it uh, stroke can be spoken as stroke slant or slash whichever 
uh, whichever is best for you. So when you upgrade, and I hope you will uh, at some point, you must add an indicator to your call sign while awaiting your new license class to show up in the FCC ULS if you use your new frequency privileges. So you're, you're going to get your technician class. Uh, at some point, you will hopefully upgrade to, to a general. When you get that CSCE form saying that you have successfully graduated or successfully tested um, for your general, they're going to give you that CSCE. You are immediately a general. Even though it doesn't show it in the FCC ULS database, you are now a general. Now, the reason that you have to put stroke AG at the end of it is because if you start operating on HF um, and you show to be a technician in the ULS database, somebody's going to catch it. There are people out there who what they do is in order to self-police, they listen and just kind of verify. So if I am a technician, I just upgraded and I have my CSCE, I can go immediately get on on HF and I can identify as KD5 HIY stroke AG. And that tells everybody that I was just awarded an upgrade and it just hasn't hit it, hit the ULS yet. Soon as it gets in the ULS saying that you're a general, you don't have to do the AG anymore. It's just your regular call sign. One of the things we do is tactical call signs. Um, so it's not uncommon for an amateur radio club or organization to participate in, in something like um, a marathon, provide communications for a marathon. That's a, that's a very common thing to do, uh, as well as, uh, say, storm spotting or something along those lines. Well, instead of having to have a list and remember who is at race headquarters or rest stop two or EOC, you can just call race headquarters or rest stop two. EOC, weather service, uh, or whatever the designation has been. Uh, that way, anybody that's there can hear race headquarters answer the radio, and you can say, yeah, this is rest stop two reporting whatever information. Now, what you have to do is, if you're operating under tactical call signs, you can operate race headquarters, rest stop two, however long you want, but every 10 minutes you have to ID with your actual call sign. So I'm, I'm actually, uh, I'm an EOC EOC, you know, I'm, I'm talking to other people across the, across the County and 10 minutes come. Uh, usually what I will say is KD five HOI operating as EOC. That way there is a call sign associated with that tactical call sign. So tactical call signs, you identify with 10 minutes, every 10 minutes. After you receive your first computer generated call sign, you may be eligible to change it into a call sign more meaningful uh, to you using the vanity call sign program. So just like you can get custom plates on your car, you can also get a custom call sign. Um, call signs with your initials, call sign representing a special interest, um, call sign of a deceased relative, which is very common, etc. cetera. Um, the stipulation is that call sign has to be available. You can't take a call sign from somebody. It has to be available. Um, if you're going to do the call sign of a de deceased relative, um, the FCC will want you to prove that they have uh, gone what we call silent key, and they will give you that call sign uh, just basically to keep it in the family. I've seen that happen time and time again. So as a technician, you can request a one by three or a two by three vanity call sign. Uh, the one by two or two by twos, those are for extra class licenses. So once you work your way up to the top, uh, you can get a one by two, a two by two, and there's also a two by one that you can you can apply for, but you have to be extra for those. So you are going to be able to get a one by three or a two by three. So why does the SEC issue call signs? One simple reason to identify the operator or station that is transmitting. That's it. So whenever you transmit, you must identify. Uh, you identify by transmitting your call signs. So if I'm having a conversation 
uh, on the air with a friend and I say, uh, or I, you know, 10 minutes comes, I can say this is Katie five H O I. That's all I had to do. Just give my call sign. That way, if for some reason the FCC were to be uh, monitoring, they'll hear my call sign and they will know who it is, is transmitting. So that's the reason we get call signs is to just identify the operator and the station that's transmitting. So according to the FCC regulations, you must identify in two ways. At the end of a call, uh, end of a contact, when you're basically whenever you're saying your goodbyes, and then every 10 minutes. So you can have an hour and a half long conversation, or QSO as we call it, as long as every, at least every 10 minutes, maximum of 10 minutes, you identify. Um, as I said, you identify by transmitting your call sign. 10 minutes is kind of the max. Uh, if you want to give your call sign every minute, that's every your call sign every minute. That's fine. If you want to give it every nine, that's fine, but no more than every 10 or no, no, do it at least every 10 minutes. Otherwise uh, you might get zinged for that. This is a requirement also applies when making transmissions to test your equipment or antenna. So you might, you might set up a new antenna and then uh, you want to do some testing. You go to a random frequency and you start doing transmissions. Just give your call sign every once in a while. You know, this is KD5HIY testing, testing an antenna or something, something along the line. Just give your call sign and that way you stay legal. Uh, additional requirement for special event stations. Now, this is different than tactical this is special event stations. This is the one by one. The W5H is what we had here at the uh, the Hearst Club. Uh, identify the station as above, as you know, at the end of your contact or every ten minutes. W5H, but the operator operating the radio as W5H needs to identify with their call sign once an hour. So a tactical is every ten minutes with your call sign, and a special event is every hour with your call sign. So that's a little different there than it's used to be, but that is, that is the easiest way to, to think about that. Even though it's not required by the FCC regulations, it's a good idea and common courtesy to identify yourself whenever you're going to call another stations. If I wanted to call another station in this example, KM5 TT, this is N5 YM or KM5 TT, this is KD5 HIY. It's the person you're calling. This is KD5HLY. So this is the person I'm calling. This is the station's initiating the call. In this case, that's actually me. Um, those of you in law enforcement, I know it's exactly the opposite, so you might have a little trouble with that. But this is how we do it in amateur radio, and it's uh, it's worked for a long time, and it's uh, it's good and easy to hear who it is that you're trying to call. If you wish to join an ongoing conversation, uh, we will frequently call this a QSO, QSO. That's a, what we call a Q sign. Uh, between two or more stations, just wait for a break between transmissions and say your call sign once. Uh, other stations will generally acknowledge you and give you the opportunity to join in the conversation. Uh, if they're they're engaged in a in a conversation, you know, back and forth, it might take them a minute to acknowledge you, but generally. Uh, hams are, are pretty good about allowing you to join in. Some will even say, hey, let's stop and see if there's anybody out there who wants to join in. So just give your call sign and the other stations will acknowledge you uh, and give you the opportunity to join in. This is the International Phonetic Alphabet used for voice communications. We often call it phone. You'll see on uh, on logging programs or anything like that, it says phone. Um this is what we use for phone communications. If you look at these, every single one of them has its own uh, identifier. So Alpha, Bravo, Charlie. Uh, one of the things that you'll also notice, none of them sound like the other. So you're not going to mistake one phonetic letter with another because none of them sound even close to being the same. This was adopted by the International Telecommunication Union um, the ITU is what we call them. Um, the words are internationally recognized and substitute for letters. 
So regardless where you call in the world, generally uh, hams on the other end will recognize and ex- kind of expect you, especially on HF, they'll kind of expect you to use the uh, phonetic alphabet. The FCC says phonetic use is encouraged, uh, especially if you are as a new ham and you get on a repeater locally or you're, you, you meet somebody, you can give them your call sign. You can give your call sign on the air uh, in phonetics. And it, that's, that's generally pretty good because uh, let's just say somebody wants to be cute and use random word combinations. Not everyone will understand them, especially – um, somebody who maybe English isn't their their first language. So the, if the uh, the operator identifies as K zero always take X lax, well is that K zero A T E? No, that's actually going to be K zero A T X. Um, so try to stick as close as you can to the uh, the standard phonetics. Um, You'll want to use the that the ITU phonetic alphabet whenever possible. So I've talked about the ITU a couple times. They are, or they are a worldwide organization that established regu- regulations and frequency rules. So they basically every country in the world is in some region, uh, one of the ITU regions. And they've all, all these countries have come together in region two, region three, and region one and said, here's what we want. Here's what we're going to standardize. So it's divided into three regions uh, in order to assist with the management of frequency allegation, alloc- allocations. Now, the reason that they do this is because here in region two, the United States, we have different operating privileges than say region one or region three here we have certain bands that we get to use that region one won't or region three won't example the uh the european union i believe they have the four meter band we don't have the four meter band um and so this is just a way for each region to kind of say this is what we want but also keep it in line with um and not cause interference with the rest of the world Let me go back here. Uh, anytime on your test you see uh, anything about the ITU, the United States is in Region 2. So any questions that you have and it starts talking about the ITU, the United States is in Region 2. If it's talking about Region 3, we're not concerned with it. Or region 1, we're not concerned with it. So we are concerned about Region 2, and that will reflect on the test itself also. So it is your responsibility as a station licensee, licensee to operate in accordance with the FCC rules. When you transmit using an amateur radio equipment, you are the control operator. You are in control of the apparatus, as I said earlier. You're in control of the radio. Every amateur radio station, when it transmits, must have a control operator. Somebody has to be responsible for that equipment somebody whether it's you or it's uh, uh somebody else a trustee or somebody somebody has to be uh the control operator of that equipment so looking at this this is uh, a couple of examples here the license operator designated to be responsible for the station's transmission so in this first one that's a base station the control appar- uh, operator is the person the control point is the mic and then the actual station is going to be the radio as well as up on the, uh, the other corner, the radio is the, the transmitter. That's going to be, uh, give the transmission. The control point is there where the, uh, the radio is. And then the, that person is in control of that radio. So they are the control operator. The control point is the location at which the control operators function is performed. So that is, uh, that, just think of it as the control operator is the person. The control point is the microphone where you actually key the radio and then the transmitter. Now, in amateur radio, we do a lot of things. Uh, sometimes the control point may be remote. Um, a lot of newer radios have the ability that the head can control 
the uh, the actual transmitter and body of the radio remotely over a network. Um, this is called re- remote control. So in this example, you can see the control operator. He's sitting at the control point. That's where he actually controls the transmitter that could be in another state, another town, another country. Um, the transmitter is remote, but it's still controlled by the control operator at his, in this example, it looks like at his home. The next thing is we have what's called automatic control. Uh, this is a very, very common thing. Um, repeaters, we, we oftentimes will talk through a repeater. Uh, the control operator can be at their house and then the transmitter, the control can be, and the control can be completely remote. We have no access where we can't actually touch it, but we take our radio and we talk to the controller and the transmitter and remotely, and it actually will transmit the radio and transmit our voice or data or whatever it is. So the control operator is here at the house and the, uh, the control and the the transmitter and receiver is all automatically controlled, usually by some sort of a computer. But somebody can can intercept if it starts going haywire. Somebody can take control of it. So the control operator of an amateur station is always limited to the operating privileges of his or her station. You don't you don't magically gain privileges by going to another ham's li- uh, uh, house or control station. So a technician class licensee operating the station of an extra class licensee still has technician class privileges. They don't gain any kind of privileges for using another HAMS um, equipment. As well as an extra class licensee operating the station of a technician class licensee still has extra class privileges. You maintain what you already have. Now, in this situation, uh, both operators are going to be responsible for proper operation. Um this is oftentimes what you will see in what we call an Elmer situation where you'll have, say, an extra class licensee um, teaching a, a technician or Elmering, as we call it, um, mentoring. They will be at their house showing them how to build an antenna or giving uh, some kind of information, helping them out. Everybody still maintains their their current class privileges and if they're both if they're both on the air, they're both responsible for proper operation. Okay, so I'm going to ask a few questions. These are going to be straight out of the uh, book. Um, I'll give you a few seconds to to think about the answers before I show them on the screen. Uh, so, who makes the rules and issues amateur radio licenses? That is going to be the Federal Communications Commission, the FCC is what we call it for short. When do you officially become an amateur radio operator? You will become an amateur radio operator when your name is posted in the FCC ULS database with a call sign. What are the three types of station control? We just talked about those. We have local, which is can be a handheld radio, uh, remote, and then automatic. So local is a handheld radio. Remote is going to be uh, running the transmitter at a remote station, and then automatic is fully automatic, um, generally like a repeater, but can be taken control of any time as needed. When can an amateur radio operator communicate with an amateur in a foreign country? Anytime unless prohibited, prohibited by either government. There are some, some governments out there that you cannot legally talk to. Uh, I don't have a list here, but uh, there are some in the Middle East and other um, hostile government, I guess you could call them, that you are not allowed to talk to. What language must be used by the U.S. HAM for identification?
English. So you can talk in whatever language you want, even if you're here in the United States or abroad. Use whatever language you would like, but you have to identif- identify in English. That is the, uh, the, the, the catch right there. What is the term of an amateur radio license grant? What is the term, the duration of an amateur radio, amateur radio license grant? That is going to be 10 years. So 10 years, you can renew 90 days before expiration, and then you have a two-year grant. And I just told you the answer. Two years. So the grace period for renewing an amateur radio license without having to retest is two years. Who can become an amateur operator in the United States? That is going to be anyone except a representative of a foreign government, a diplomat or a foreign somebody working in a foreign government. What is the minimum age to become a ham? So there is no minimum age, um, and I'll give you an example. There's a club right down the road that I'm part of. Uh, they had an extra class girl. She was nine years old, very sharp, uh, but she was nine years old, had, a, had, uh, had her extra class license. So that was, that was pretty impressive. Which of the following is a purpose of the amateur radio service rules and regulation as defined by the FCC? So we're going to be in enhancing international goodwill. goodwill. Um, the reason that B, the other ones are not right is because we don't provide inexpensive communications for organizations, business or emergency organizations. Training of operators in military radio operating procedures, that is not something we do. So you can mark those out as well as D and enhancing international goodwill it is. Why does the FCC presume presume to be the control operator who does the FCC presume to be the control operator of an amateur station unless documentation to the contrary is in the station records that's going to be the station licensee that's going to be the person who has the license saying that they have their license and this is the equipment that they can operate Which of the following methods are is encouraged by the FCC when identifying your station when using phone? We like to use the phonetic alphabet. Um, the other ones, I don't, I don't, uh, I don't think you need to send your call sign in CW as well as your voice, and you do not have to repeat it three times, and you don't have to go to full power. So the use of phonetic alphabets, if you look at these, um, you will recognize some of the things that we talked about. When do the FCC rules not apply to the operation of an amateur station? Uh, never. The FCC w- rules always apply. You can't – they're not a um, – not something that's just a, a hit and miss. It is they always apply. From which of the following locations may an FCC licensed amateur station transmit in addition to places where the FCC regulates communications? Look at this one very closely. And the answer is D. The other answers make kind of make sense. But from any vessel or craft located in international waters and documented or registered in the United States. So why is A not correct? Well, every country is in the ITU. Um, from within any country that is a member of the United Nations. Well, that's, that's not something that the FCC governs. And then I did say that uh, anywhere within the ITU regions two and three were not we don't talk about region three, so only region two. So that one is out. So it's going to be any vessel or craft located in international waters and documented register within the United States. 
when under normal circumstances may a technician class licensee be the control operator of a station operating in an exclusive extra class operator segment of the amateur bands? That is going to be no time. Uh, some of the other ones did apply at one time in the past, but they no longer do. It is no longer. Uh, you can no longer kind of be um, blessed with the uh, the privileges of a higher level uh, licensee anymore. When must the station licensee make the station and its records available for FCC inspection? At any time upon request by an FCC representative. Let me tell you when and what you can do. If they were to show up, if you were um, doing some malicious, something malicious, causing intentional interference um, on a repeater or something like that, and you receive a warning letter, uh, it's not going to be out of the question that maybe an FCC representative of uh, the Enforcement Bureau show up at your house now if they show up and they're they're like well, i'm with the fcc i want to see your equipment and that kind of freaks you out a little bit you can tell them please wait i'm going to call a police officer to come and uh be here basically with you they're not the men in black they don't just come in knock your door down and and do what they want they they are there for a specific reason and that's to look at your equipment so, this is a discussion period. We're going to take a short break, uh, probably about ten minutes or so, um, and I'm going to I'm going to jump in the chat also to s just uh, kind of follow along and see uh, see if we can answer any questions. Cool, man. Uh, go ahead and unshare your screen if you don't mind. There we go. Okay, great. We got some really good. Thanks, Chris. Uh, we've got some really good discussion going on in the chat, have for the last, uh, for pretty much the whole time. Um, several technical questions were asked about um, felonies and um, past, uh, past charges on your criminal charges or whatnot, and I think Noel did a good job of answering that. And um, <clears throat> uh, one thing that um, I just thought of something, what was it? <laughs> uh, let's see. I think we've been we've been pretty much on top of everything in the chat. So, yeah. Uh, let's see. Do online testing. And if I if yeah. I get going a little too quick, you can always just pop in and say, "Hey, slow down. You're I, going too quick." <laughs> I think you're I think you're fine. I think you're fine. I, I haven't had anyone say slow down. So, okay. um, uh, the, there's been quit. The, there's been questions asked because we we've got about. I think we had about 70 or 80 people watching when we started, um, and it peaked. It's, it's, it's telling me 189 right now, but it peaked around 210 at one point. So I'll go ahead and answer some of, some of these questions were asked during the chat, but I, and I said this up front, so it's going to be a repeat for a couple of people. These live streams will be posted on the YouTube channel after they end. So this stream is going to end up being... Um, Two, between two and two and a half hours long, something like that. So once I click end on the stream, the live stream is over. YouTube processes that stream and automatically posts it to my channel. So you will be, be able to go back and watch it. Um, it'll probably take YouTube an hour or two, maybe two to three hours, something like that, because it is a longer stream. I mean, two, two, two and a half hours long. That's a pretty long episode, pretty long video as far as YouTube standards go. So it might, it might take a little bit of time for YouTube to process it, but that's all done on the back end by YouTube. And once that's done, the stream will absolutely be playable again um, after that. It, um, go there. Yep. Uh, you can take a break if you want to, Chris. But, um, so there's that. Um, question's been asked a few times. Uh, so you, you'll be able to go back and, and watch that. Um, there were some questions about 10-meter uh, privileges for technicians. There was a recent change on that where, 10, where technicians can now use 10 meters uh, FT, on FT8 on 10 meters where they couldn't before. 
a certain different part of the band. I don't know what all the specific changes were, but there was some newly updated rules about technician technician privileges were expanded. I'd have to go look it up to see exactly what those were. I just know they were expanded. So um, that is a good uh, good news for for those having a technician license for a long time and who have not taken the time to upgrade yet. So, yeah, questions in the chat are being asked about remote testing. Again, we are not giving testing. This is just a training course, but we've got two links that Frank has shared several times tonight um, of entities that will do online and or remote testing. One of them is at hamstudy.org forward slash sessions. Uh, you can see that if you scroll back up again. Frank will put that up there in a minute, I think. And then the other one is at the Anchorage uh, Volunteer Exam Coordinators. They've, they've actually been doing remote testing since 2014 for about six years. Uh, you have to have a proctor in the room with you, but that can be another ham, a law, a law enforcement official, several lists of that type of people, and you can do a remote test through their session with, with a proctor. So... Um, there's a couple different ways to do that. Uh, yeah, practice test uh, page recommended is aa9pw.com. Chris just posted that in the chat. And um, and there, Frank just put the links to the two online testing sessions where you can go sign up. There is a waiting list. You're not going to be able to sign up for an online test today and go take it tomorrow. There's a waiting list because everyone's sheltered in place right now. And ham radio has uh, the, the number of people wanting a ham radio license has exploded ever since uh, COVID-19 happened. Um, I am sad that COVID-19 happened, but I'm, I'm very glad that people are wanting to get into amateur radio. I, I think that's a um, good thing overall. I hope that that uh, desire continues past uh, all this shelter in place stuff. So um, thanks to everyone for joining tonight. We are going to continue here in a moment. Uh, we're about, oh, about halfway through it, maybe, something like that. Um, maybe a little bit less than that, so we're going to continue going. Uh, put, your com put your comments in the chat. Put your uh, questions in the chat. Um, Chris, just let me know when you're ready to come back. And uh, you good? Let me switch. Uh, switch that. Yep. There we go, and okay, now it's you and I again. So, uh, Ted asked, what about Canada when it comes to online testing? Uh, depending on what your citizenship is, the Anchorage VEC does Canadian testing. I interviewed the guys from the Anchorage VEC about a week ago, and if you go back and look at the videos in my channel from the past week or two, you will see a 20, 25 minute interview I did with Anchorage VEC and they give you all the information you need about taking a remote proctor test through their organization. So I'm trying to get the guys from uh, um, the Greater Los Angeles Amateur Radio Group. This is one of the places that is doing online testing. I've invited them to come on the show. Hopefully you'll see that upcoming. So uh, let's see. Okay, I think we're caught up. You guys go ahead and keep asking your questions. Special thanks to Frank and Noel and Mike, K at MRD, and Steve, uh, good game in the chat for uh, uh, helping to uh, field those questions. Chris, if you're ready, you can have it back. Okay. There we go. All right. Okay, so we we've, we've kind of gone over what the uh, a little bit of what uh, amateur radio is, what's expected, uh, licensing. Um, we're going to kind of go over some of the rules now. Um, amateur radio licenses are issued, as I said, by the FCC. Um, all the rules that we operate under as the amateur as amateur radio operators. Uh, are in part 97 of the FCC rules and regulations. So you can, you can just uh, go to the search engine and you can type in FCC part 97 and download a PDF of everything, or you can go to the ARRL um, who is a um, kind of the big U S amateur radio um, group. 
they have links on there and have a lot of information that uh, about Part 97 also. So as we said, the FCC makes and enforces the rules and regulations for the amateur radio service in the U.S. Um, and like I said, they do reserve the right to conduct an inspection of your amateur station at any time. Um, you have the, you also have the right to have like a police officer there if you're unsure of, of why the men in black just showed up at your house. But also keep in mind, you really have to do something uh, bad in order to in order to have them show up. You you really have to ignore their warnings and not communicate with them how you fix things. I mean, so it's not just they're not just going to show up at your house. They've got better things to do unless you're really just uh, being a nuisance. Uh, amateur radio licensee is responsible at all times for the proper operation of his or her station and equipment. That includes protecting it from, say, let's just say children. I've got three of them here. Um, they should be stored or configured in a manner to prevent authorized use. So at the house, you can do something like disconnect the microphone, the power cord, etc. Uh, in your car, remove the microphone if it's a portable. Keep it in a locked cabinet, drawer, or other secured location to where uh, little fingers or any any other potential source of interference can access them. Um, one of the things that you want to look for whenever you're asked this question is disconnect the microphone and power cord. Uh, that's something that you can do as well as remove the microphone. Those are in yellow. Uh, so those are key points. Things that are not allowed in amateur radio. Um, transmitting music. Think about your, your background. If you're driving down the road, uh, you've got your favorite show on, and it's uh, there's music playing in the background, and you key your microphone and you transmit music. You're not going to have the FCC knocking down your door if it's an accident, but if you continually do it, um, they, they may have something to say. Manned spacecraft. If you are transmitting music to a manned spacecraft, say like the ISS, uh, you it is okay to transmit music. Um, I would say uh, kind of limit it as much as possible. But if it's something that you you feel you need to do to a, a spacecraft, it is okay. We don't we don't broadcast to the general public. Anybody with a scanner or radio can pick up uh, the radio and listen to what's being said. It's not private, but we are not a general broadcast. We're not like a commercial broadcasting station where anybody can listen to it on, you know, in their car or anything like that. It kind of has to have specialized equipment um, and programming. Transmitting of codes or ciphers, encryption is what that is, is not allowed. Now there is an exception. We do have uh, amateur radio satellites that are transmitting um, uh, control data, telemetry, um, that can be encrypted because you don't want just anybody being able to control your spacecraft. So you need to, you are allowed to encrypt that data in order to keep your satellites safe or your space station safe. That's the only time that uh, encryption or um, cipher if, if you're you know trying to hide something you're using funny code or something like that you know speaking in different way whatever it, it's obscuring the message is not allowed that's that's what it is except for space spacecraft or satellite control we do not cause inter inter intentional interference excuse me um, what this is is this is deliberate attempts to let's just say um, <clears throat> somebody is on a, a repeater that you have come to not like. It is illegal for you to get your radio and start transmitting. And you, when you do that, you're essentially locking the repeater up to your radio, uh, blocking others from being able to use the repeater. That's called intentional interference. Uh, it's not limited to just that but it is something that is deliberate you are deliberately causing a problem um causing interruptions obstructions and that will 
that will get you um, a visit by the FCC quicker than anything else. Deliberate and intentional interference um, is a big no-no. Another unidentified transmissions, um, you can control a remote control model if you want. Um, you will soon hear if if you don't have a radio already. Um, there is a practice on repeaters called kerchunking. People will take their their radio and they will key up a repeater to see if they make it. They'll listen for the re- the repeater to come back and then they go about their merry way it happens all the time um it is it is not legal to do that so if you key up a a repeater or a transmitter just give your call sign that's all you have to do even if it's just for a radio check you can also say um 85 hly just doing a radio check and you're legal to do that so just an unidentified transmissions are something that is uh is not legal um using indecent or obscene language please don't use racial or ethnic slurs off-color jokes um we are a a good community generally i say generally um we're we're a really good community that most you know you, you you're able to make friends with so you don't want to we're not trying to be offensive here um so try to avoid indecent or obscene language. Um, if you wouldn't say it in front of your mom or grandma, please don't say it on the radio. That's that's generally what I go by. Uh, there is no list of, of bad words, no official list of bad words. Um, so also, let me go back, transmitting false or deceptive communications that I think of that as gossip or... Um, you know, talking about somebody uh, in order to do harm of some sort. And then business communications, we absolutely cannot provide business communications for um, even a nonprofit or any kind of business. No communications for hire related to your job. Um, now, we also do a swap net. Uh, some repeaters, some clubs do a swap net saying, I have, I have a radio that I would like to sell. Uh, it works fine. Here's what I'm asking for. You're letting people know that you have something for sale and then they can reach out to you offline. You can say, you know, here's how much I want for it. But this is generally a business transaction from a, a an actual company of some sort. So you're okay with swap nets. Just don't, don't, you're not a radio for hire company. Pecuniary interest, um, here are some exceptions. Um, I'm giving this, I, I'm actually doing this class with you. Uh, I am not being paid to do it. I'm volunteering. But if I were a teacher working at a school and I were doing this class, my salary is is income. It is a pecuniary interest. As a teacher, I can be paid as just part of the regular classroom duties to teach this class. That's the only time that I can actually be paid to teach this is because I am a I am a professional teacher and I'm doing this as part of my class. Um, public health officials who use amateur radio for external hospital communications during emergencies. Um, this is very common here in the Dallas-Fort Worth area. Every hospital has amateur radio in it. Um, I mean, we've got pretty redundant communications systems for all public service, but you never know. I mean, there's if something goes down, something happens, uh, they have the amateur radio to fall back. Not making money from that, though. Police fire and emergency management personnel who have amateur radio in their emergency operations center. This is also very common. Um, just about probably, if not all, uh, emergency operation centers for each city in the Dallas Fort Worth and surrounding areas will have uh, amateur radio in it, provide storm spotters or backup communications. Again, they're not making money on that. So this is these are just some of the examples where uh, a teacher can be paid, but people who are are being paid to do their job but not making money on the amateur radio itself is okay. Essentially, we are 
licensed to communicate with each other. Two-way communications. One-way communications, that's like testing of equipment, uh, RC model boats, aircrafts, robots, uh, beacons. There are stations out there that just all they do is beacon a beacon Morse code nonstop. And then position reports, which we'll talk about, I believe, tomorrow or Saturday. Um, if you're going to do a, a control, a, an RC aircraft or boat or robot, your uh, your transmitter, your little transmitter box will have to have a label on it with your call sign. And then you're limited to one watt of power. Always identify with your call sign. So essentially hams, well, let me go down the line. Two-way communications with other hams on amateur frequencies uh, do not include just communicating with the general public. Anybody can be a ham, uh, but we, like I said, we don't broadcast to the general public. We don't broad or we don't uh, uh, use our license to talk to CB operators. They are not authorized to legally talk on amateur radio. And then other radio services, whether that's FRS, uh, GMRS, businessman, or other other um, public service type things. There is one exception. Uh, each year there is the uh, Armed Forces Day Communications Test. Um, so communications with Armed Forces during this time is allowed. And you can, you can just uh, uh, find information online about that. Uh, that's not something we're going to cover here other than this is an exception where you can't communicate with another service itself. So transmitter power, while not exceeding the maximum power permitted on a given band, use the minimum power necessary to carry out the desired communications. Um, most bands, and I say most, not all of them, have a power rating of about 1,500 watts. Um, some down in the, the HF are limited far less than that. Um, but 1500 is generally the, the maximum in general. If you, if you're transmitting that much power, you, you, you might have a reason to be doing that. Um, if you use the minimum power necessary, uh, it gives you two benefits. It reduces interference. So if you are having a conversation with somebody, let's say, um, a friend, a couple, a couple streets over and one watt is perfectly fine to get from your house to theirs, there's no reason why you should have to run a hundred. Um, it reduces interference because if you're talking to the, talking to somebody right down the road and you're at a hundred, hundred Watts, well, you're not just talking to that person down the road. You're also talking to the person, another city, maybe even in another County. So, and that's that's completely unneeded. So use only what you need. If you can carry out a conversation on five watts in your mobile, that is that's perfectly fine. We don't we don't need to try and um, you know just try and talk to the moon. Um, another thing it does is if you the the lower the power on transmit on your portable radio, the longer your battery life will will last. Uh, the higher the power, the more more it takes and your battery will will degrade quickly not degrade your battery will drain quickly so just use the minimum power necessary there's no reason to go overkill so this is basically the very very basic um layout of of, of how we transmit so the microphone uh, is going to convert voice into electrical waves the transmitter can convert those electrical waves into radio signals, and then the antenna radiates the radio signals. So that's a, a basic way that you actually transmit. And then when you receive, the antenna captures the radio signals, and then it will convert those radio signals into electrical signals, and then the speaker will convert those back into sound waves, analog sound waves. So that is the, uh, the basics of a transmitter and a receiver. So we're going to get a little, just a little bit more technical here. Um, an electromagnetic radio wave, and a radio wave is also known as an electromagnetic uh, wave. It travels at 300 million meters per second, which is also the speed of light, a little, little higher than, or a little lower than that, but 300 million is a way go by. You're going to want to memorize 300. 
three hundred million or three hundred because that's gonna that's gonna be an important number uh, in your ham your ham career. So if you look at um, the little squiggly line right there, that's a sine wave. That is basically a simplified version of what a radio wave would look like. It's just a simple up, down, up, down, up, down of uh, electromagnetic wave. Uh, you may have heard me call radio frequencies uh, RF. That's just we love our acronyms uh, in amateur radio, so we'll call it RF um, instead of radio frequency because it's, it's shorter. They are radio waves are composed of both an electric and a magnetic field. It is non-ionizing, so it's not like X-ray. Um, so that's uh, that is a, a, a people used to, to panic about a cell phone being close to your head causing cancer. RF energy is not ionizing. It is it is, it will it will cause heating if if anything. So 300 million meters per second also known as the speed of light. You want to hold on to that because we're going to talk about it again in just a second. Radio waves are usually described by frequency and wavelength. We are going to calculate both frequency and wavelength here in just a minute, and you'll be surprised that it's, it's actually easier than you think. So one way to describe uh, the unit of frequency is by hertz. Now, one way you can think about this, if you look at this sine wave right here, up, down, up, down, positive, negative, positive, negative, that's just, uh, that's electricity works the same way. So down, up, and pause. That is considered one cycle, one hertz. Uh, the power company will use a large alternator to produce the power at its generating stations. Um, the AC supplied to your home goes through 60 cycles, so 60 up-downs, um, shifting from positive to negative and back to positive again each second. So the electricity from the power company has a frequency of 60 hertz because it has gone down, up, down, up, down, up, 60 times in one second. So that is how you measure a frequency and be able to tell what the frequency is in this one. Uh, let's just say this is one second here from between A and B. That would be one hertz. So they are electric and magnet magnetic fields that cycle back and forth very fast. Hundreds, thousands, millions, billions, trillions uh, a second. So 1,000 cycles is a kilohertz. So this is kind of a, a metric measurement here. So a kilohertz, that is 1,000 uh, up, down, up, down, up, down in one second. Uh, one million cycles is a megahertz. So we call that megahertz. Um, it does continue to go up from there, gigahertz, terahertz, petahertz, uh, just depending on what the frequency is. So it's just the up, down, up, down motion in a given time period. Another thing that we, uh, we talk about is wavelength. So the lower the wavelength, the longer the wave, excuse me, the lower the frequency, the longer the wavelength. So if you look at this top one here, you have one hertz, and then compare that to the one hertz down on the bottom one, the, uh, the, 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 that wave is not as compressed. And so that wavelength is how long it takes them to go from center up, down, and back to center. However long that is, that is what we call the wavelength. Um, the higher you go in frequency, the shorter the wavelength. So if you think about amateur radio, when we talk about uh, six meters or two meters or 70 centimeters and so on and so on, those are actual wavelength in meters. And so um, six meters is a longer wavelength than two meters which is a longer wavelength than 70 centimeters, which means you can actually, usually you can talk further on, on a lower frequency. And that's one of the reasons that you can generally talk worldwide 
on the HF, the 30 megahertz and below frequencies. So wavelength is measured in meters, and this is a representation. Uh, you can see that the gap here on this lower frequency than this higher frequency right there. So when we, um, this is another representation of, of wavelength here. So the wavelength cycles, positive, negative, positive, negative. Um, this is going to be the distance for that one cycle go to go uh, positive, negative, back, you know, start. It's basically a sine wave. That is going to be your wavelength. Now, it's still going to travel however far in one second, but this is just how long that that cycle actually is. We call that the frequency. So I told you to uh, to memorize that 300 number. The way that we um, calculate frequency and wavelength is using that 300. So let's just take an example here. We want to know the wavelength of a uh, of a frequency. Let's just take uh, 100 146 megahertz. Uh, so that's 146 million hertz, 146,000,000. The speed of light is 300 million. So you know, we want to simplify that, knock off those zeros, additional zeros, and we're going to divide 300 by 146. And that's going to give us our wavelength in meters. And that's generally going to be right around two meters. Um, if you want to fill in, let's say, um, 52 megahertz, 50 megahertz, 300 divided by 50 will give you a wavelength of about six meters. So that's that's where that, when we talk about meters regarding uh, wavelength or, or bands, that's where it actually comes from is, is talking about that wavelength, that calculation. Then you can also do... Um, to find the frequency. So if I say, I want to know what six meters is, how, what the frequency of six meters is, let me take 300 divided by six. And that's going to give me about 50 megahertz. And so you can, you can use those, you can use that 300 number to find out both of those. If I give you some random number, like, um, oh goodness, let me say like, 23 centimeters well you can you can pop those numbers in there and you can get the frequency um and then you can also turn around and get that that wavelength uh for that band also we generally round them to the to the nearest meter uh just to keep things simple so radio frequencies are divided into three groups actually there are more groups but for this uh this is what we we're interested in here HF or high frequency, that is three megahertz to 30 megahertz, from three to 30 megahertz. Uh, VHF, very high frequency, that ranges from 30 megahertz to 300 megahertz. So three to 30, then 30 to 300. And then on top of that, UHF, ultra high frequency, is 300 to 3000 megahertz. So they're just different ranges. We keep going higher and higher, but for this this instant right now, that's really not uh, important. You can look those up on your own at another time. But uh, this is what you need to memorize: HF and the range, VHF and the range, and UHF and the range. There's not really an easy way to uh, or a memory jogger for it, so you just kind of have to memorize it just say it over and over or whatever it takes for you to to memorize because it's just it's one of those things that you have to memorize so this is going to be um uh, your operating frequencies you're going to get multiple six meters and higher um so if you look at this six meters 50 megahertz to 54 megahertz that's in the vhf range this is something that uh whatever it takes for you to memorize these. There's not a, not a memory jogger for this other than just repetition. Um, so if you look at this 50 megahertz to 54 megahertz, that's six meters. We did that calculation a minute ago. Um, 
to to get you can flip between those two uh, those two numbers there. Two meters, 144 to 148 megahertz. So that is uh, you can do that calculation also to back and forth to get those numbers. If you look at the very beginning or the very uh, start of those, they have a small area of uh, what we call mode restricted subbands. Those are exclusively and that that range right there exclusively for CW or Morse code as we call it. That uh, uh, Morse code is no longer required to get your ham license, but because it's no longer required, it's actually more popular than it has ever been because you're not required to learn it. More people are interested in it. So you want to memorize that. And it's usually pretty close to the same in most of the bands that have a sub band for Morse code. Um, in that first little 100 kilohertz area right there, um, that mode restricted sub band for, for Morse code. 1.25 meters. Um, that's a long name. We like to call it the 220 band uh, or just 220. This also has a, uh, a sub band, a mode restricted sub band for point to point digital message forwarding, which is kind of like uh, pagers, like the old school pagers. That's kind of what it, it, it is. So that has a, a, a mode restricted sub band for that. It goes from 219 to 225. There is a gap in there. Part of that was sold off to UPS recently. Uh, so there is a little bit in the beginning, kind of a, a no-go zone, and then the rest of the band also. But you need to know 219 to 225 uh, is going to be that that important frequency. And again, like I said, you just you just you have to memorize these. Um, we keep going up 70 centimeters, 23 centimeters. Um, we will oftentimes call the 70 centimeter band. We'll just call it 440. That's uh, that is not in common. It's a 30 megahertz span. Uh, 420 to 450 uh, is that frequency range. And then the 20 centimeters, if you look at this, that's 1240 megahertz, also known as. Uh, if you're going to do the math, 1.24 gigahertz to 1300 megahertz or 1.3 gigahertz. It's just however you want to look at that. Um, that's some pretty good. That is actually prime real estate right there uh, in the RF spectrum that uh, many companies and businesses would like to have their hands on. But we, uh, we get that special treatment because we are – working to enhance the, uh, the, the radio frequency art and, and history. Um, 446.00 megahertz. That is what we call the national calling frequency. This is a frequency that no matter where you go in the country, generally you can flip over to 446.0, throw out your call sign, and oftentimes get some sort of a response um, two meters also has one. It's very, very popular. One, four, six, five, two. But for this, this, uh, this instance here, four, four, six point zero is the national calling frequency kind of, um, I don't want to call it the equivalent to channel 19 on CB, but it serves kind of that same function. Um, that's where most people think of on CB is going to channel 19 and listening, on 70 centimeters or 440 band, 446 is kind of that that uh, frequency that you go to. <clears throat> Some frequencies in the ham bands are available for use for us as a secondary basis. Um, we can use the frequency as long as there is no interference to the primary users. Uh, if there is interference, the ham must stop transmitting and fix the cause of the interference. And that may just be transmitting. Um, secondary basis, I'll give you an example of this. On the 70 centimeters or 440 band, uh, in a certain area on that band, we are considered secondary. And I don't know if the military still uses it, but they are primary. So if you're talking on there one at some point and you hear something going on, 
that's clearly not amateur radio and it doesn't sound like some sort of just malicious interference. It could possibly be the military or whoever it is that has primary uh, permissions to that frequency. And you have to stop if you cause interference on there. Uh, Somebody can complain to the FCC and you could get some sort of uh, an advisory or warning letter. So we are secondary basis. I've been a ham for 21 years and I have never heard military or anybody on the 440 operating as a primary. Um, so this is a confusing subject for some, and I've spent a little bit of time, spent a lot of time thinking about how, how to explain bandwidth. Um, so bandwidth is going to be the amount of space, the radio frequency spectrum in, in that spectrum that a signal occupies. Um, we call that the bandwidth. Uh, the bandwidth of a transmission is determined by the information rate, how much information you can actually transmit on the carrier uh, of a purely continuous unmodulated carrier, um, how much actual information can be transmitted. So uh, the easiest way I came to think about this is think about um, water hoses. Think about like um, uh, one of those little plastic hoses in a in a, uh, a fish tank. It's very small, very small amount of water can get through it. Um, the next one could be a water hose, and then the next one could be a fire hose, and then you know continue going all the way to the the amateur television out here would be something along the lines of a uh, you know a main water line or something. That is going the bandwidth is going to be the amount. In that example, the amount of water that can go through that line. Same thing happens with uh, with uh, RF. CW is like that little little water line in an aquarium. It's very 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 narrow, 500 hertz. It's not even a, a kilohertz wide. Um, RITI, RTTY, 700 hertz. It's it's next. Sideband, uh, single sideband voice on HF. Uh, is generally two to three kilohertz. So 2,000 to 3,000 hertz. Um, and that's, like I said, that's the amount of, of information that is sent on that carrier. FM is 10 to 15, actually 10 to 25 kilohertz. Uh, so that's one of the reasons that if you if you go from listening to an HF radio to listening to an FM um, uh, conversation on a uh, on a handheld radio or a mobile radio, the FM sounds much richer, just much fuller. There's a, a wider spectrum of information that is sent. the The smaller amount of bandwidth that uh, a service uses, like CW, it's gonna it's not gonna be rich and and just you know sound really really well. Um, amateur television is basically just television like you you have in your living room it's it's just television you set up a camera and you're transmitting over our uh, over amateur radio six megahertz there's a lot of information in there that gets transmitted in order to have the picture and the audio so more information means more bandwidth and that is the best way that i have thought about um uh, way to think about uh, bandwidth. It's just the amount of how much how much uh, information can be transmitted or can be can be sent. Uh, we call that NTSC on the amateur television, and that is still uh, pretty popular. A lot of it's usually in the higher bands. Um, just just television is what it is. Long distance television sometimes. CW is the narrowest. Uh, Morse code is what that is. That is sometimes called um, the mode that gets through when nothing else does, because it's just such a a fine um, amount of information that has to be sent. It generally will get through when nothing else will. 
So we talked about bandwidth, uh, and one thing that you have to be careful about is not to operate too close to the edge of the band. So when you see a frequency of, uh, let's take 54 megahertz FM voice here. Well, like I said, FM is 25 kilohertz. That's how wide it is. Well, the 54 megahertz, that is your uh, kind of your center line right down the middle of that. That's where your carrier is. So that's that sine wave is actually going out uh, off of that center point. And so if you position yourself at 54 megahertz and you're operating FM, half of your signal is actually going to be outside of the uh, legal band that or the band that you're uh, you're transmitting you are transmitting illegally so you have to you kind of have to do the calculation if uh and each band is going to be different depending on the mode that you use um so we're not going to go in detail on different modes but you have to be aware you don't want to set yourself up on the band edge because you might actually be transmitting outside of uh, outside of the band itself so let's think of uh, – um, we're still talking about bandwidth here. So we're – there's always these little snap, crack, pop, snap, uh, hiss, pop, all this stuff that's going on at all times in, in radio, always. It's it's always there. This, uh, this is what your radio is listening to. Your radio is listening to everything all at once. It receives everything regardless of what it is. Um, it's later then discriminated down into what you will actually hear. So this is just, it's basically wide open. It's listening for not only what you want, but it also hears everything else you don't want to hear. Uh, most HF radios and some high end, uh, VHF radios, you can, that could do sideband. You can kind of turn that down. You can turn that bandwidth down, um, to where you're not just hearing every single bit from band edge to band edge, you can turn that down and, and uh, like this. And so what we're doing here, we're turning that bandwidth down. We're kind of focusing in a little bit more. So that's stuff that's outside of the box. We don't hear, well, we can continue. We can keep narrowing that bandwidth down. We can narrow it down to um, where we are only, where we're still picking up a few crackles and pops, but all that other stuff out there is gone. We, we've kind of eliminated that, and we are just hearing that signal that we want to hear. That is one of the reasons that your radio will come with a bandwidth knob. Um, that way you can you can kind of tune all that out because you, especially with the HF, it's, it's pretty cramped spaces down there. It's not uncommon to find somebody who might um, – be very close to you in frequency um, and kind of uh, when they start transmitting, they kind of bleed over onto you because you're, you're listening to everything. Well, you can narrow that down into a, a much finer uh, receive, receive frequency there uh, bandwidth. And that way you can kind of notch them out. A narrow bandwidth mode like SSB single sideband uh, is better for long distance communications. We are going to talk about uh, single sideband in a couple of days. I believe on Saturday, it might be tomorrow. Um, but uh, that's one of the things that you use. And if you can kind of narrow down uh, that bandwidth to just what you want to hear, you'll end up. Uh, your, your ears will thank you because it's, it's getting rid of a lot of the, uh, the extra stuff out there. So ham radios come in many shapes and sizes. Um, this is not an official rule, but it's kind of, uh, something that you probably will hear. Generally the more knobs and buttons and screens that a radio has, usually the more expensive it will be. Uh, that one that's uh, in the top left corner up here, I believe, I don't know what, that's a Yezu of some sort. That radio is, oh gosh, I would easily say uh, thousands of dollars. The uh, the ICOM that is right here, um, that's a sub 1000. That's a great radio to start off with. 
these are mobiles. Uh, this is a mobile HF. This is a mobile uh, VHF, UHF, dual band. Um, this is going to be another HF radio. Um, and then these are just some smaller, um, older handy talkies, HTs as we call them. Um, so they all have their purpose. And the way you can differentiate those is generally a base transceiver has the capability of transmitting you know, 1 to 200 watts. That's not uncommon. They're usually large, uh, and because they're large, they will uh, sometimes use AC power. Um, a lot of radios are going away from AC power and, and kind of using DC power now, so you have to have some sort of an external power supply or battery to run them. They do require an external antenna, and they are um, – sometimes the antennas can be large depending on what frequency. Uh, generally have HF um, – only HF or HF, VHF, and UHF, uh, all modes, CW, sideband, and FM. Uh, so it, it basically does everything in the toy box. Uh, mobile transceivers can go from 35 to 100 watts. They're a lot smaller. They will use the power from your car battery. Um, they can also do HF or HF, VHF, UHF, and then all mode, just like the big uh, the big base ones, but they don't do as much power. They also may not have as uh, sensitive as receivers, just because a base transceiver is designed to really pull out uh, anything that it can hear. Uh, a handheld transceiver is just like your your cell phone. It's small size, has internal batteries, has an attached antenna. Typically three to five watts. There are some now that will do a little bit more, uh, 10 watts. Typically uh, VHF and UHF only. Some uh, probably 99%, if 99.5% are FM only. You might be able to find something that does something else, uh, like digital. Um digital as far as like APRS, which is uh, position reporting. Um, they'll also do like a, a digital trends, uh, a digital trend, di turning your voice into a digital. So um, that's the big difference there. Usually s size all the, going all the way down to, to handheld from, from something that's installed permanently at your house. Now here in the DFW area, and I I would uh, assume in most others, there's uh, probably dozens, if not you know tens of hundreds of, of repeaters in a certain area. There is no way that you can memorize every single one because you would have to memorize the transmit frequency, the receive frequency, the CT, CSS, access tone, or PL tone, as some refer it, your transmit power level. Um, most radios, including the, uh, the cheap Chinese ones, um, will have memories. So what you do is you, you program the radio with the repeaters that you want. You set all the information. You set the, the frequencies, the, the access tones, the power levels, uh, and you store that in the radio. And then you can just use the knob on top or wherever the, 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 the knob is to, to just navigate through and find the repeater that you want. Uh, most newer radios, uh, including the, uh, the inexpensive, ex inexpensive ones, the, the Baofeng and the uh, Titera and, and things like that, you can do uh, alphanumeric names. So you don't even have to see the frequency that you're on anymore. You just say, uh, in, in, in the case that I have on my little handheld right here, um, I can just say, go to Hearst VHF or Hearst UHF. Um, and then everything is there. Everything I need to access that repeater is there. So that is, that's what you would put into the memories in order so the radio can memorize it and you don't have to. So if you get a mobile or radio or even, uh, um, even a base radio, they may take DC power instead of AC power. And if that's the case, you're going to need a power supply. There's different kinds of power supplies. 
some of them give you um, more benefits than others. In this case, a regulated power supply keeps the output voltage steady regardless of the variation in the input uh, voltage and protects the equipment from voltage fluctuations. So this is saying it can go, you know, 117 volts up to, to uh, 124. Well, this power supply will regulate that to 12 volts. That way, no matter what your AC line is doing at the house, it's going to put out 12 volts. Um, these are generally more expensive. They're better power supplies, but they're generally more expensive. Uh, you can get a, 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 a uh, power supply that's that's cheaper, a switched power supply. Um, they'll provide the you know a good good solid voltage out too. But a regulated power supply is the kind that will kind of uh, act as a filter. You know, act as a it will regulate that power to take that that fluctuation out. So that would be something that you have to have for a. Uh, for a radio that requires DC. Uh, what is the unit of frequency? We're going to do a little short review here. So what is the unit of frequency? We've talked about this a little bit. It's going to be the Hertz. The Henry and Farad are electronic components. The Tesla is a car and a coil. We're not going to worry about that. So we, we're interested in Hertz. Hertz is what... Uh, what we measure our frequency, our radio frequency in. And which of the following occasions may an FCC licensed amateur station exchange messages with a U.S. military station? Briefly talked about this. It happens annually. And it is going to be during an Armed Forces Day communications test. Which of the following is a result of of the fact that the amateur service is secondary in some portions of the 70 centimeter band. I gave you an example of that, of why we are secondary. And these are long answers, so I'm going to give you just a couple more seconds. I see in the chat, A is very popular. <laughs> Good job. U.S. amateurs may find non-amateur stations in a oh, there's a delay there <laughs> and must avoid interfering with them. What amateur band are you using? If you're transmitting on 223.5, so you can either do the calculation or if you have it memorized either way, it's a, it's a, uh, it's been around for a long time and it's starting to, uh, see more popularity as more radios come out. It's 1.25 meter band. The 220, it's a very quiet band. Very, very nice. Um, a lot of radios are starting to come out with that. What is the national calling frequency for FM simplex operations in the 70 centimeter band? Talked about that briefly. And it's kind of like that channel 19 on CB. It's the 446.00 megahertz. So, um, yeah, I don't know if the uh, the current material will also ask about the two meter band. The two meter band is 146.5. So, in this case, 70 centimeters, 440 is 446. And if that asks for two meters, well, you can say that's. That's 140 uh, something megahertz, and 146.52 is its answer. Hope I didn't confuse people there. In which of the following circumstances may the control operator of an amateur station receive compensation for operating the station? So if I am a teacher and it's part of my classroom material, when the communication is incidental to the classroom instructions and an educational institution, that is um, the only time I can be compensated for using amateur radio. Which of the following is a permissible use of the amateur radio service? Answer is D, allowing a person to conduct radio experiments and to communicate with other licensed hams around the world. 
again, we don't provide low cost communications for businesses. Um, and we don't earn additional income for passing messages. We definitely don't broadcast music, uh, and videos. That's uh that's a big no, no. So, uh, D is the answer to that one. When are you allowed to operate your amateur station in a foreign country? Answer is A, when the foreign country authorizes it, and you will uh, uh, have to look up a reciprocity agreement between the two countries. Um, uh, I'm sure you can find some of that on the ARRL or ARRL.org. I believe they may have some information on that there. So if you're going to travel abroad, you can take your radio with you. I've done that before and use it. Just make sure that uh, you're following their rules. When is an amateur station required to transmit its assigned call sign? I want to read these kind of closely because the wording is very limited on, on, on what's different. So you want to you want to identify at least every 10 minutes. That's going to be the maximum number. So at least every 10 minutes during and at the end of the communication. And this is going to be a little conversion. Which of the following frequency is equal to 28,400 kilohertz? Okay, that answer is going to be 28.4. So we just uh, basically shifted the decimal place to the left. 28.4 megahertz um, is what that converts to. What is the approximate bandwidth of a single sideband voice signal? We talked about this while, uh, while we were in the uh, bandwidth section. The answer is going to be 3 kilohertz, B. That is going to be the how wide, how much information can be sent on that radio carrier. What type of wave carries radio signals between transmitting and receiving stations? This is one of my favorite questions. The answer is electromagnetic. That is what makes up an RF signal. Um, magnetic, magnetostrictive. I, that's still one of my favorite answers that uh, uh, out there, but it is very much wrong. And then surface acoustic, we don't hear RF signals. So electromagnetic, that's what you need to know. What are the two components of a radio wave? What are the two components of an electromagnetic radio wave? That will be C, electric and magnetic fields. And how fast does a radio wave travel through free space? It's going to be at the speed of light. Three, we, we round that up to 300 million meters per second. So it go real fast. Uh, what is a way to enable quick access to a favorite frequency on your transceiver? That's going to be store it in the frequency in a memory channel. That way uh, you don't have to remember hundreds of frequencies and offsets and tones and everything that come comes with it. So we are officially done with session one. Um, we can do some discussion. I'll pull up the, uh, the sheet here and uh, we'll see what kind of questions we've come up with. Cool. All right, am I, no, I'm muted. There, now I'm unmuted. <laughs> there we go. And that's probably better right there. All right, good, thanks, Chris. That, uh, boy, that, that last hour flew by. I looked up, it was like 10 to 8, and I'm like, wow. Whoa. <laughs> that went really fast. But uh, So uh, let me just say real quick, one of the things that you'll want to do, um, you'll want to start taking practice tests. Mm. Uh, the sooner you start practice tests, um, the, the easier it is to find out what you need to not only work on, um, but uh, it'll get you conf uh, more confident in taking the test because – uh, when you sit down, 
you're going to be given a workbook um, and you're also going to be given uh, an answer sheet. Mm -hmm. And while we can't exactly replicate that in, in practice testing, there are some websites out there that do a really good job. The one that I've always recommended to, uh, to students is AA9PW, Alpha Alpha 9 Papa Whiskey. You go there, you click technician. It randomly generates um, a test for you, and you can go all the way through that test and hit submit, uh, uh, hit submit, mm -hmm. and it will uh, then give you the answers. There are other ones out there that do pretty good, um, like uh, QRZ. Yeah, QRZ, QRZ has, has one. one. Mm -hmm. The problem I have with QRZ is if you're going through the test and you don't pass everything, if you as soon as you you hit the cutoff of however many you miss, you're done. And you don't get to go all the way through. So if you can practice going all the way through the test, you're going to be in a better position to uh, you'll be I, in a better position, more comfortable. I just linked that AA9PW URL in the chat as well, so you can click directly on it. So. All right. So let's see here. What about drug charges? Oh, he's already uh, he's already shared I think that. that. I think that most of these questions that uh, that we copied have been answered. Yeah, Noel gave a really descriptive answer of that specific one. Uh, let's see. Are there contingencies for veterans who have TBI issues? Yes, the most of the times the VEs are really uh, lenient on people with both medical issues and vet veterans, both. Um so someone asked, uh, does the call sign change when you go from tech to general? Uh, not unless you want it to. You can choose to have a vanity call sign. Um, what's it, like 90 days after you get your tech or something like that? Oh, goodness. They just changed it recently. I'm yeah. not sure. They took the fee away. Um, but, no, it's not going to change. Um, I've gone all the way up to extra, and I've, I've been KD5HLY since I started. Right. I've never... I've never gotten a call sign. I've got, I guess, too much invested in, uh, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> in my call sign. That's how I am too. Yeah. So, uh, yeah. Somebody asked about uh, use of FT8 and FT4 on the 10 meter band for technicians. That's something that just recently changed. Also, um, I knew it was about to change. I didn't know it. Someone in the chat said it had changed already. So that's a, a recent change where technicians can use FT8 on 10 meters now. Yeah, and and you got to be careful. Um, FT8 is is a digital mode. Right. Um, you're not going to get a lot of HF privileges as a technician. You do get some, especially on 10 meters, but uh, most of those are either going to be limited to CW or uh, on 10 meters. You get a little, just a little spectrum right there. I think it's two, maybe 300 kilohertz, where you get voice. Um, so FT8, FT8 is kind of out of the scope of this, um, uh, out, out of the scope of this, this class. I don't really want to really well, want to talk about it cause it could start causing some confusion. Yeah. And th there's not uh, any questions on the test about it. Yeah. The class is, yeah. the class is to, t to, to prepare you for the test. You don't really need to know that, but that was a question that was asked and it was a good mm -hmm. question. Oh yeah. So, um, what about your second renewal every 10 years? It is every 10 years. Yes. Mm -hmm. Uh, let's see. Any other questions that might be coming through? Yeah, any other questions in the chat? Now is the time. We're at just over two hours. Um, we will reconvene for the second part of the class. Um, t in fact, well, let me go get that. I've already got that uh, live stream link created and posted, so let me go grab that link. But we will reconvene tomorrow evening at the same time, 6 p.m. Central Daylight Time, Central Standard Time, whatever you want to call it. Technically, it's Central Daylight Time. And then someone had asked a question about uh, if the class time was the same all three days. Um, it is yes, actually, it's the same pretty, today pretty and much. tomorrow, but Saturday it's actually in the morning. Yeah. Um, so here Saturday is... Saturday morning we're going to do 10... Uh, probably go uh 10 to I, I say one i don't think we'll go that long um 
but about 10 to one okay. um, is what I've got. I've got set aside in my calendar. So um, just start doing the best thing to do is start doing uh, those practice tests. You'll, re- you'll yeah. realize that uh, unless you've gone all the way through your book and you're really confident, uh, if you're just starting out, you'll get about roughly uh, 30 percent, 33 percent, 40, maybe 40 uh, because it's uh, that's what we've covered so far. Mm-hmm. So the best thing you can do is take practice tests. And that's uh, even even now, just after one of the one class. Right. Right. Totally. Yep. Just keep practicing until you're consistently passing the practice test and then you're probably ready for it. So, uh, yeah, someone asked about a, oh yeah, yeah. Okay. So Rhonda asked, is it a retest every 10 years or just a renewal? The only time you have to retest is if you let your license expire past the two year grace period. And then you have to go take the whole test over again and you'll be issued a new call sign too. Um, so if you keep renewing your, your license every 10 years, when they send you the notice, usually you get an email um, and you got 90 days before it expires and two years after it expires, as long as you just pay your $15 fee, I think it is, and fill out the form, it just renews, and you keep the same call sign, and it keeps going. There's no additional test. So... Dan uh, Garcia, happy to have you. Uh, it's uh, It's been our pleasure to, uh, to do this. Thank you. Mm-hmm. For sure. So, can I still test in Kentucky with a Texas driver's license and get a Region 4 call? Or do I need to have a Kentucky driver's license to test? That is a question I don't know the answer to. That's a good question. Um, as far I believe as long as you have a, a – I don't want to say this wrong. I, I'm not, I'm not going to – I don't know. I don't know the answer to that. But uh, I'll send a VE a message and – and see if I can find that out. Cause that's a, mm-hmm. that's an interesting question. I believe as long as your driver's license is valid, then you should be able to test. Now, whether you get a, a, a regional call where you live or where you're from, I don't know. I don't, I mean, if you test in Kentucky and you're a resident of Kentucky, then I would think that you probably would get a Kentucky region call sign, whatever that, mm-hmm. if it's four out there or whatever it is. I'm um, going to, I would I would probably say it's going to be whatever your either your mailing list uh not mailing list listen to me um your uh mailing address is mm-hmm. or if you can't prove that then whatever your government ID is going to be mm-hmm. um but again I'll I'll see if I can get an IVE to 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 clarify that mm-hmm. Yep. Okay. There we go. Louis Moya, I agree with you. Uh, oftentimes, the class is easier to, uh, you know, have the information presented rather than reading. I have a programming class that uh, I'm in right now that currently have to read and then write code, and it's brain meltdown. <laughs> yeah. Uh, Nathan and Sarah Mooney, AA nine PW Alpha Alpha nine Papa Whiskey dot com. That is uh, that's one of the best sites that I have uh, come across. Mm-hmm. And if you don't mind me taking the screen again, go ahead. So this is this is a non PW. This is the website that um, you're not sharing your screen. Oh, there it is. Okay. Uh, is. You don't have to sign up if you don't want to. You can just say um, take a practice test, technician, take exam. Boom. These are the same questions that are in your in your book, and it even label it even has a label right here of what the question is. So you just go through. And then when you get to the bottom, it does have some figures, you know, what is what. Uh, you hit submit, and then it will pop out a, uh, a result for you.
we've like I said, we've covered about in this class, we've covered about uh, about a third, maybe just a little bit over a third of these questions. So some of them may look familiar, some may not. Mm-hmm. And QRZ is another one. Um, hey, there's me on the front. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, where is it? Am I missing it? Uh, I think it's on. Uh, oh, right there in blue. Yeah, practice. Right in blue. Yeah. And then you can just say, uh, we want the 2018 technician. Mm-hmm. And it does a really good job. I mean, you know, you click these, it'll tell you, sorry. The only thing I don't like about this is as soon as you get to that cutoff of 26, you're done. You don't get mm-hmm. to go all the way through and then see it's, it's as soon as you, as soon as you cut it, that's it. And I don't, while I think it's a good resource to, to have, um, I think using the AA9 PW is, is a better, uh, I think it's a little bit better resource. Mm-hmm. Yeah. It's uh, as far as t- taking practice tests goes, I, I like the way it works better as well. So, so let's see here. Are the questions in the book the same ones that I will that we see on the exam? Yes, yes, exactly the same. It will just be a a selection of thirty five of those uh, taken from that book. But yes, you will see the same questions. Oh, you already answered that. <laughs> That's all right. <laughs> Any other questions? Yeah, anything else? This was really fun. Thanks, Chris. Um, I got a lot of comments in the chat throughout about how detailed it was, and uh, somebody said that you have a a great voice for radio, so I guess that's good since you're on the radio. (laughs) (laughs) I was born and raised in the South, so I I know the people that are probably from up north hear my uh my hick accent <laughs> yeah. really bad i hear my hick accent but i can't do anything about <laughs> yeah. it <laughs> yeah but no we we present this we want to make sure that uh that you understand why you know, right reading a, anybody can read a book but oftentimes whenever you read a book you don't you don't get the real reasoning of why it's uh so we we like to present this information for anybody um, mm-hmm. and you get the, the whys to your, the, the questions that are, are presented. Yeah. And I got that question. Of, I've been advertising the class for two or three weeks, something like that. And I got people, um, emailing me and sending me Facebook messages and asking, Hey, is this just going to be memorized question and answer? Or are you going to actually mm-hmm. give detail about why the question, why the answer is this? And I said, no, this will be a, a really detailed class. There's there's books out there you can go get that'll just teach you the question and answer. Um, and that's and that's if that's what you want to do, that's okay. But but there's also people out there who want to understand it a little bit more. And that, and this this session does a really great job of doing that. And there's so much uh, that you can do with ham radio. I mean, if mm-hmm. uh, you read about it, I remember the when I was. Uh, I think I was a sophomore in high school. I was reading about it. I didn't have a clue with some of the stuff I talked about or was reading. Uh, if yeah. there was something like this to where it broke it down exactly why it would have, it would have, you know, just been great. But uh, yeah. 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 I think that uh, anybody, anybody can read the book. Mm-hmm. Uh, mm-hmm. I mean, you, you can read the book. There's a certain expectation that we have that maybe you have read the book. Cause if you don't, if you have not read the book, you you'll get most of this stuff, but uh, you won't pass the test if you don't if you don't read this, read the book in combination with this. This is just mm-hmm. a, a, a another resource to help you. Right, right, yeah. Somebody, uh, Vic Victor is asking, uh, wondering if I need the book. Yeah, um, yes. I mean. I guess technically, if you just wanted to go to AA nine PW and start going through that, and if you've if you've if you watch the whole class tonight, if you retain information very well and start doing it like that, you don't need the book. But I, in my opinion, it's going to make it a lot easier for you. I will show you. I'll show you what I used to actually get my extra, and I think you may have mentioned it. Here's what I used to get my extra. Spires. 
I use this website, hamstudy.org. Um, I spent a money, a money, let's see here. I want to make sure I get the right one. I spent a month of studying this every day, three hours a day, because uh, it's a really good resource. I mean, you go into study mode. And you can you can read the question. You can click over. I'm just going to click one. And then, oh, up here, you can flip over, and it it will give you the same information. Uh, so that's a, you don't have to have the book. You can use this. It is possible. I did it to yeah. get my extra. Um, but the book is also beneficial because it 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 also tells you why, but if you, if you don't buy the book that, I mean, you can still take the test. There's no problem uh, with that. It's just, you know, experience shows that that is uh, probably the easiest way mm-hmm. to learn the information. Mm-hmm. I interviewed the guy who runs uh, Richard KD seven BBC who uh, runs and operates ham I interviewed him two or three weeks ago. So you can see that he's, he's, uh, he's been very um, heavy into, uh, getting online testing to become a reality for a long time. So he's been working on that really hard the last, well, for, for several years actually, but really hard for the last couple months. So, um, so yeah, that's a, that's a really good, uh, that's a really good study website for sure. Dan asks, why is the technician ticket so limited on frequencies? Um, I don't have an exact answer for that, but what I assume is because the technician class is, it is a, it is your intro into ham radio. Um, I th- I think it's a good um, it, you get a lot of privileges and the VHF is honestly the easiest place to start. Mm-hmm. HF is uh, is is a lot of fun. I mean, it really is, but it can be overwhelming, especially with uh, if you have a radio with uh, five hundred knobs. Uh, it can be overwhelming, and so. I don't know. I don't know if that's that's why it is. Other than that's just what what they determined. Um, but it's. Uh, I mean, if you want HF, get your general. It's. Right. It is a. Uh, it is a step up. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's also a good class, Jason. You have that on here right. um, that we recently did. Mm-hmm. Um, but I mean. You know, if that's if that's if you, HF is where you want, then um, you know general is where you want to be. Um, I know I get asked all the time about extra. Why why upgrade to extra? You get a little bit more spectrum. Mm-hmm. Um, one of the reasons that I got my extra was because uh, I had been a general for ten years, and I just. I felt it was time, you know, make that, let me, let me make that jump. And also I wanted to be able to give test. I, I am a, a VE with the ARL as well as the uh, W5YI also got the um, commercial examination rating. Um, and so that, that's one way that I feel like I can also give back uh, to the community is, is, you know, doing things like this and uh, um, giving tests um, because eventually you, there's no way to know everything, but uh, you can, you can, you can learn a lot and then you can either help people because ham radio is, there's a lot to it and it could scare people away. I mean, if they're, if they don't know where to go or what, you know, I just got my license. What do I do? Mm-hmm. Well, mm-hmm. you can be an hour to somebody. Um, Mm -hmm. and you can do that. You can do that being Elmer as a technician. There is nothing at all wrong with, uh, with being a technician. I don't look down on people that have technician at all. Uh, we all started there. Mm -hmm. So, uh, um, yeah, but once you've been a technician for a while, you're going to start to get the itch to get general. Yeah. Uh, because HF is quite fun and, um, you get more privileges, you get more, uh, more, stuff to do like uh, parks on the air and summits on the air and that kind of good stuff. And, um, which is, which you can do with VHF, but you is typically more common with, with HF and uh, field day, that kind of thing. And it's once you kind of 
do that the first time, you're going to be like, oh, man, this is this is where it's at. You're going to love it. <laughs> where so. have you been my whole life? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> uh, let's see. Main Notary Net. I want to I want to get, uh, get accredited with the W5Y, but I can't find the way to do this on their website. So what you need to do is uh, if you know a W5YI uh, VE or a CVE, a coordinating VE, like basically a team lead for W5YI testers, you need to talk to them. Um, there's an application that you need to fill out with the W5YI and it basically what it does is it certifies to the W5Y that you are part of this this team, this testing team, and they are teaching you. Don't go to the ARL first. If you if you want to get the ARL also, don't go to them first. And the reason is if you go to the ARL first, you have a, a test that you have to take, and it's a long test. If you are with the V uh, the W5YI, you're on you're actually certified in a team then what you can do is you can make a, a copy of your W5YI credentials, send that to the ARL, and they say, oh, okay, you're already a V, so you know what to do. And then they will accredit you, and you don't have to go through the the testing process. So find a uh, find a, um, a, a VE team somewhere, probably at your local club, find the coordinator of that, mm-hmm. and say, I want to, I'd like to get accredited and they will actually they have to sign sign the forms off and stuff like that and send it off so it's not something that you can do directly you have to go through the team lead and that's something that's different than the ARL the ARL you do the test you send the paperwork they send you the credential and now you can go wherever you want the mm-hmm. the W5Y they want you to be a part of a team mm-hmm. So find that team lead or find somebody who is accredited right now in your area and talk to them and they can get that ball rolling. Yep. I have a w, I'm a general and I have a W5YIVE. So I can only test technicians, but I have that for later on. Mm-hmm. So and I've, I've done VE at the club a few times for some new techs. It's fun. It's fun to be able to do that. Anything else? Well, this has just been a whole lot of fun. I've really yeah, enjoyed for sure. this. Yeah, for sure. It's I got been, a little uh, nervous there that my voice wasn't going to hold out. Yeah, somebody said you Earlier. should. Take, somebody said he needs to take a drink of water. He's going to dry his throat out. I'm like, yep. well, he's, he's got he's got a break coming up. So, <laughs> yeah, uh, yeah. Maine Notary Net says, okay, you missed my first post. I am in Maine, and my call was this, and I'm a VE with AWRL for three years now. Well, still reach out to W. You still need to reach out to someone W5YI who's a team lead, and they should be able to just take your information. All I did was fill out a form and submit it to my team lead, W5Y, team lead, uh, VE, and that's that's all you have to do. But you have to know someone, um, preferably some someone in your state, I would think. Um, so that's that. Mike wants to know, when am I getting my extra? <laughs> whenever whenever N5YM Mike gets the, gets the class done. <laughs> oh, my goodness. That's going to be such a long class. It is, yeah. It sure is. This, this technician class is three days. Uh-huh. Uh, each each PowerPoint presentation is a, is just shy of 140, 150 slides. I can only imagine uh-huh. how long. Yeah, it'd probably be about the same, probably three hours a day for uh, weeks. The yeah. extra exam is – it's. It's, almost, it's a beating. It's almost I mean, twice it's, as many questions. It is a it is a commitment. Yes. You have, if you're gonna get it, it is a commitment. If you don't memorize answers easily and you you have to learn stuff to actually learn it. Yeah. And remember it. Mm-hmm. It's a beating. It is. It can be. Yeah. For but sure. it's it, you know it's worth it. I mean it. Yeah. It was. Uh, I was. A, I was a technician for five years. Upgraded to uh, general. Um, I, I upgraded to general when you had to learn 13 word a minute. And mm. so I did my, 
kind of a shame to say, but I did, <laughs> I did my written. I didn't get my my code done, so I did my written uh-huh. again, uh-huh. and then I did my my code and finally got it. And then, like a month later, they canceled the. <laughs> <laughs> uh, that figures, yeah. Oh gosh. Okay, I, I'm terrible. not mad at them. Yeah, yeah. Oh, that's good. Uh, let's see. Are there any plans for remote testing for a new tech wannabe in the next several weeks? Anywhere in Cali? Uh, yeah, Glarg. Greater Los Angeles Amateur Radio Group. Uh, Google G-L-A-A-R-G. They are doing remote testing. They're, they're out of Los Angeles, obviously. They're doing remote testing for people nationwide. They're not just limited to California or Los Angeles area, but they are one of the two or three groups that are doing remote testing. They're really heavy into it. Glarg, G L A A R G. So, there are no W five Y I V E S in Maine. I looked. Oh well, just a thought. I, mm-hmm. Have you emailed their office? They're based out of Texas. They're about. 20 minutes south of us um email I, I don't know if you've emailed them and asked them i mean i can tell you how to do it here but i don't i mean i i say go down there to their office and walk in the door and fill out a ve form <laughs> but uh if you're up there in maine you probably don't have that you probably don't want to fly down to texas just to do that so um i would contact their office in arlington texas is what i would do okay <laughs> yeah yeah but cw's good so all right well hey man we've been going for two and a half hours um appreciate your time tonight chris i'm gonna go ahead and close it down guys we will be here tomorrow night 6 p.m standard time uh central central standard time i should say uh same time as night it'll probably be another about the same length you know two two and a half hours something like that um any kind of questions you have between now and then if you think of something you don't want to wait uh email it to questions at live from the hamshack.tv. We'll try to field those. I'll put those, if I get some of those overnight and tomorrow morning, I'll, I'll put them in the, uh, the, the chat tomorrow and we can kind of start out with a small, really quick refresher and then jump into it real quick. So, um, yeah, anything else, Chris? No, I don't think okay. so. All right, cool. Thanks, guys. This video, what, once again, people keep asking the same question over and over again because there's people coming into and out of the chat and that's okay. Um, this once I hit end, YouTube will process this video, a couple hours probably, and then it will be posted on the channel for replay as many times as you want to watch it. So um, if you missed part of it, don't worry. It's going to be here for a long time. So 73 to everyone. Appreciate it, Chris. I'll talk to you in the morning. And um, y'all have a good night. Have a everybody.